The Procurement Man, Phase 2, At Home with the Gas Giants, Part 3. The Machine Wakes Up. Was it mean coincidence that the machine started back up with the arrival of spring? Probably not. For all things, even those that are man-made, are in the tune with the rhythms of the world. Light slowly brightened to full strength. Excess fluid drained away. Warm, dry air filled the superstructure. The semi-autonomous denizens of the machine stepped out of their hibernation pods with confusion and disappointment stamped on their features like an indentations from a wadded sheet. As they caught the eyes of their fellows, this shock at the disparity between their dreams and the reimposition of time was replaced with smiles and familiar curses. Good morning, sunshine. Is it morning? Is there sunshine? You are my sunshine. Enough chatter, everybody, ordered one of the older ones, grown stout and heavily ornamented during his sleep. Let's prepare for the interpretation of the initial instructions. Who put you in charge? No, the, of the older ones demanded. The bossy one indicated to a collection of wings that now covered the sides of his head. Enough indicated. With surprising speed, given how creaky everyone felt, the machine's inhabitants, little machines themselves, took their places at the controls and monitoring equipment around the chamber. Once they had secured their persons, connected their nervous systems, and initiated the flow of narco narconutrients, they had only to wait for the first order of the day. As the minutes piled up, more and more eyes strayed to the great tank, filled with green, foamy water that dom dominated the center of the room. Gurgling noises emanated from a half-dozen portals, ringing its top, reassured the little men that all was working properly. They only had to wait. The old one, who had taken command, knew that the restlessness was building. Something must be done to keep the interest and energy levels high. He began climbing the service ladder behind the tank. Be careful, old one, one of the younger servitors called. Back to your places, the old one, resplendent in his long burgundy coat, barked. You'll have something to do soon enough. Once he was atop the tank, the old one reached into his coat and withdrew a piece of paper and a pen. Without taking too much time to think about it, he scratched out the words... Another two markets lagged behind Fish Family News. Then unsteadily bracing himself with his feet, the old one began turning the handle holding shut a hatch on the sides of the tank. Watch him fall in, one of the others, neither young nor old really, whispered to a colleague. The latter nodded knowingly in return. Indeed, the old one did fall in, only moments later. Gas exploded throughout the chamber. Old one! Someone shouted as the many little booted feet of the one in charge disappeared flailing through the open hatch. Everyone abandoned his post and crowded around the tank. Several struggled with each other to be the first to climb the ladder and attempt a rescue, until the cry from the observation and display window side brought them all around. Look! Finger-like projections on the ends of, the t of tentacles and noses, or nose-like things, were raised towards the window, where a floundering mass of burgundy and whiskers churned the green water to an even foamier state. An old bundle of digits flung up its burden, a matted mass of ink and pulp against the glass. What does it say? Looks like installation green spot and heteronymous flak, flak bash. How do you get all that out of that? demanded someone, indicating the, smoggy, the soggy smear sticking to the window, even as its author sank into oblivion at the bottom of the tank. To be processed down in the depths of the machine where five-headed four ruled. That legendary figure, only rarely seen in the upper levels, now clambered aloft to offer his interpretation of the directive. You idiots! Five-headed four bellowed, as he was allowed to do, for he was beyond the strictures of seniority in politics. It clearly means prepare to generate narrative. All gaped in awe as the ancient creature returned to his station to consume the remains of his old colleague. A Deceptive Memoir Jerry, I addressed my ma imaginary friend, my book is just about finished. That's great, Jerry replied. His smile was genuine. However, since his eyes are but empty circles, I really have little more to judge his emotions by other than his mouth. No, uh, no eyebrows either, I wrote in the margins of my notebook. So now what, my friend asked. Are you going to try to get it published? I shook my head. I don't think so. There's no way that anyone will ever publish my work. I don't feel like going through the heartbreaking and ultimately fruitless effort of trying to get somebody at a publishing house to read it. It'd be like going through jury selection all over again. Well, what are you going to do? What's, was the, what was the point of writing it in the first place? Well, in the first place, have you ever heard of the theory of obscurity? 
Please, not the residence, Jerry begged. I'm just not in the mood. Okay, so you've heard of it. And by extension, you understand the concept of doing something just to please yourself. Masturbation. Jerry, I sighed. You're having sex. The other person leaves the room. But you continue. Is that masturbation? Yes. Of course it is. Are you suggesting that the world of publishing has left you behind? I have said it before. This is not the world I wanted to grow up in. But anyway, I am thinking of alternate means of distributing my work to the people who need to read it. Not the web. No. I looked out the window. A futuristic cityscape of loops and cones and huddled cubes and giant hats lay before me, extending from the foot of the old building in which I was now to the, in which I now was to the edge of the dome. I think we've moved beyond the web. I'm talking about leaving copies randomly on benches at the bus station. In this way, you hope to obtain the exact audience that your work deserves. I considered, well, I could always hang a tray around my neck and pass out copies as I walk down the sidewalk. No, no, don't do that. In this capitalist society, if you give your work away, it has no value. It has value to me. That's true of anything. No, I'm talking about value to others. You must make the attempt to sell your book. Yes, but to whom? Jerry joined me at the window. To someone who appreciates the snobbery of the word whom. My favorite fruit. What's that? The snobbery. Jerry apparently didn't find this particularly funny, for he didn't laugh. He recrossed the big room and threw himself down in a padded leather chair near the oversized globe. Too bad this globe is so out of date, he thought. It's so old it doesn't even, sh even show the kingdoms of, of electrostasis. He turned his gaze to the painted ceiling overhead. It showed an immense toadskabode reaching out of a window in the sky to swat at hordes of invading, invading alien spacecraft. Indulgent, self-aggrandizing nonsense, he thought. Meanwhile, I strode to my desk and sat down before the manuscript of Tonsillary Breakfast Condom, my novel. It had grown beyond the boundaries of its original conception. Not that I had ever had much of a conception of it in the first place. To include areas that were normally the domain of comic books, documentary films, puppet shows, quilting bees, animated candy commercials, plastic models of classic monsters from films and mythology, and rock albums of the psychedelically enhanced variety. That, that, that themselves, in turn, incorporated all of the above and more, along with the help of it illustrated booklet recapitulating these themes. Clog. Alex Spaghetti had decided to join Rusty McCabbage's group. The decision had been a difficult one, but once he hit upon the idea of combining his club with McCabbage and the others, everyone's, everything seemed so clear. I'll put forward the proposition that we merge with you, he explained to Thalaris, McCabbage's assistant. What if the other members don't agree, she asked. It's my club. I founded it. If they don't like it, they can start their own club. But the Federal Nexor Association will be a part of... Y you know, I don't think I've ever heard anyone mention what your organization is called. Thalaris, a humorless woman with a face like a bag of potato chips left, left open for a week, did not choose this moment to begin smiling. We don't really have a name. The community is called Cadilgan Valley. After... The community is called the Cadilgan Valley after its location, but I don't, th I don't think the organization has a formal name. Alec looked down, looked at the windows. Look, Alec, Alec looked at the workers who were busy taking. What? Alec looked at the workers who were busy building. Alex's house was being built further down, close to the river that ran through the valley. He didn't object. The house was, wasn't costing him anything after all. He had chosen the design from a book in McCabbage's study. Some said it was derivative of the work of Hale Mephiticus, but actually the so-called Pocatream style dated back to the Middle Ages, when talented but sleepy young librarians seeking refuge for both themselves and the treasured books they smuggled out of the library under their rough cloaks created similar structures. Alec, however, knowing none of this, likened his new home to a beehive for one. And I'm the queen, he joked. Thalaris examined him closely. The costume he wore, a reproduction of Garlicker Gibbon's wedding suit briefly seen near the end of the fifth two-headed boxer film, made him look like a member of some bizarre, bizarre cu Cars cover band, one that specialized in halting mechanic, mani maniacal versions of mo moving in stereo, up and down in candio. You're no queen, she observed, shaking her head. Spaghetti smiled. I think I'm going to like working with you, he said. 
Later that day, Spaghetti was relaxing in his temporary quarters in McCavage's house when the food he had eaten the day before demanded egress. He went to the small bathroom that, like similar rooms in Japan, actually contained only a toilet. The bath proper was in a separate room. Spaghetti pondered the telling euphemism of bathroom as he avoided his bowels. The, he determined that he would start using the term toilet room to differentiate it. He was now living in the future, after all. It was time to jettison these verbal ta taboos. He flushed the toilet. To his horror, the water in the bowl and its burden of waste did not disappear, but rose to the lip of the bowl. Acting quickly, Spaghetti shut off the water supply at the base of the toilet and cast about for a plunger, but in this space-age dwelling there was none. He was forced to go hunting for one. It's never happened before, Lucas, one of the handier members of the commune, admitted to Spaghetti. You must have used too much paper. These toilets are an advanced model designed to operate anywhere, even in space, under the most desperate conditions. Then there are no plungers in the, in the whole community, Spaghetti asked incredulously. None that I know of. Maybe somebody has one, but you don't want to go knocking on every door looking for one. No, your best bet is to go down into the town and purchase one. Spaghetti was nearly at the tunnel that led out of the commune when Thalaris and a couple of men caught up with him. Let Grover and Merck go with you, Thalaris st stipulated. If you insist, Spaghetti replied, perplexed, not knowing that his position in the commune was still too tenuous to allow him unchaperoned access to the outside world. Don't use your cash, Thalaris instructed. Barter with the shopkeeper for the plunger. With what? Spaghetti wondered. Thalaris handed him a bag full of finger puppets with wooden heads carved to resemble various Farscape characters. Jumbo. The purse required to hold Jumbo's toothbrush, hairspray, button jar, wheelchair miniature, and lemon grove was, of course, immense. While Jumbo appreciated all that the committee had done to procure the purse for him, he resented its being called a purse. Couldn't we call it my smart bag? Jumbo asked Mr. Whitman in an idle moment. Precious few of those anymore, and those that can be recognized as such are rarely being taken, of, taken advantage of properly. Ah, but then it wouldn't be yours, now would it? Mr. Whitman argued. Successfully appeared, for Jumbo returned to his place in the fever, fever cabin and waiting for countdown. He appears to have gender issues, Mr. Whitman reported to the committee immediately afterwards by way of the milky white display board in his head. By that, I mean he identifies with his gender, demanding that traditional gender norms be respected in regard to his person. This could be a problem, one of the committee members, hidden within a deep olive green cowl, commented. Not to worry, Mr. Whitman assured them all with his gentle old hands raised. I have developed a game that I think will teach our friend Jumbo to a fat tooth found his identity on a more creative basis. What kind of game? The same committee member asked. It is a combination of card game and arrangement of a paper village. All of the members of the committee wore similar cowls. They could not see each other's faces, and this was good, for it kept them ignorant of the substitutions that were sometimes made. Yet they looked at one another and nodded in approval at Mr. Whitman's idea. How come you never joined the committee? Lomo Frenzib, a dietitian with the, with the team, asked the bearded old Mr. Whitman. Because, because one doesn't join the committee by one's own desire, Mr. Whitman answered. One has to be asked. And they've never asked you? Mr. Whitman gathered his necessary materials into a rude lump. Bunch of homophobes, he grumbled. Down in the fever cabin, Jumbo attempted to make sense of a novel by noted Martin Rev disciple Franz Dukoplup. In a letter to his mother written after he had erected his in inflatable shelter on the Martian shore, Jumbo explained his frustration. The main character, Clumpy Mike Manners, is chained to a wooden post deep in the woods. The book is supposedly all about the thoughts that run through his head as he attempts to free himself, yet the book is titled Mythic Bear, apparently after the large creature that emerges from the undergrowth and has a brief conversation with Mike Manners. I wasn't able to complete the book before Countdown, but I suspect that the bandy fronts, refreshing hen's teeth, sets fire to the woods just to get the whole thing over with. Perhaps my confusion is due to my usually re reading technical manuals and murder mysteries set in the chaotic world of live television broadcasting. This letter, like much of Jumbo's correspondence, was entrusted to Mr. Whitman for disposal. I might as well throw my goddamn game in there as well, the old man bitterly complained as he dumped the boxes of papers into the disused well. Oh, come on, Lomo Frenzy, who wanted to defend Mr. Whitman's game, now felt it necessary to protest the other man's use of the word goddamn. It's the worst possible thing you can say, he demanded. How do you figure that, Mr. Whitman demanded, sitting down amid the carefully laid out streets of a paper village. Because hell is forever, Frenzy put it as succinctly as he could. Lomo, you're an idiot. Mr. Whitman began to deal off the cards. 
He had expected that he and Frenzy would play the game, later marketed under the name Philocracker, but the latter, perhaps not wanting to spend any more time with the impious one, re-entered the abandoned house. Mr. Whitman glanced at his cards. Each one bore the name and image of a little-known Stoner Rock band, except for one, which had a picture of Martin Rev. The Walter Becker of punk, Mr. Whitman commented, rather incisively, he thought. But really, what did he know? What did he know? Leaves of grass had been in the public domain for over a century. Sweetness. Among the array of desserts available to the passengers on that frigid evening were a half dozen miniature pecan pies. Homo Lotion's doll box already contained the makings of a lemon pound cake, so he, along with his brother Joan, selected one of these pies. As they pushed them around their plates, pretending they were alien spacecraft grounded due to unforeseen humidity in the Earth's atmosphere, now relying on their corn syrup based propulsion systems, the captain, a large chested man with a tiny waxen head stood up to address those now enjoying the end of the feast. feast. Following the harvest, he began, after wrapping the tabletop, all the fruits will be gathered into, into a heap on the central part of the floor mosaic. He made a circle with his two hands and nodded his bald head toward it, making sure that his audience understood his imagery. Passengers wishing to participate in the ceremony will gather randomly about the assemblage, forming a symbol to, inter- to be interpreted by the old shaman or one of the ship's junior officers, should the former person be unavailable due to inadequacy in the fl- funds. He paused for a laugh that had not paid for its fare. This symbol is the one that hopefully one of you will find stamped on the back of your pillowcase. If not, if no one claims the prize, well, my dear friends, that is the sea. Again, the captain paused, this time chuckling as one might with a deeply dissatisfied six-year-old. Eat your dessert, Martha admonished Homo Lotion. Don't play with it. Landing gear disengaged, Homo Lotion intoned, forced continuous wing debretment. The little pecan pie rose from its place of confinement and entered the sausage-smelling cave in the sky. Some people say it contains coyote breath, Joan told a a reporter from Metal Homestead magazine. Can we get a picture of you holding your brother's guitar, the reporter asked, glancing at his photographer for confirmation that this was a feasible suggestion. The photographer, distracted momentarily by the thought that he was actually on a ship, belatedly agreed to the shot and distributed his equipment accordingly. He could feel the ship tilt slightly as it crested a particularly sticky wave. Up on the cuneiform deck, Homo Lotion and the captain discussed the similarities between commanding a large passenger ship and being in a rock band. It's all I've ever wanted to do, Homo Lotion confessed. All, the captain wondered, a sage simper on his big face. The waxing as a product of his ritual consumption of tallow reflected the slightly swaying chandelier. I must tell you, being a ship's captain isn't all I ever wanted to do, not just in the sense of right now, but in my youth, my aspirations. My goals. For one thing, I wanted to be a land surveyor. Too bad you can't be a water surveyor, Homo Lotion joked as he plotted how to get away from this literal-minded boar. No sense of fantasy. Of play, Joe answered the reporter down in his cabin. Talking about me, Martha entered and asked. Where's Homo Lotion? Joan demanded. He'll be here. I think he's still with the captain. I'd love to get a shot of you two together, the photographer interjected hopefully, wanting, wanting to help out. Yeah, we've got to have that, reporter added. He looked at Martha. Any chance you'd like to sit in on the interview, he asked. I don't have anything to say. Joan and Homolotion speak for them for, speak for the brothers. Martha responded, not looking at, at his interlocutor, but heading for the drinks rack. Oh, come on, Joan begged. Just fill in for, until Homolotion gets here. This is really good port, Martha announced after downing a third of, the, her, of his glass. <laughs> the reporter winced inwardly. How could he drink that sweet crap? Some minutes later, having obtained the necessary passes reluctantly granted, Homolotion burst into the cabin, full of enthusiasm and displaying the restless thirst that characterized his music. He nodded in agreement at Martha's uplifted, bottle-laden hand. The Rebellion and the Revolution are not synonymous. After Macrospore had established itself as a legitimate ruler of the paper lands through the electoral process, this fact was trumpeted across the airwaves by the newly independent media. The only problem as far as the Council of Fund Governance, located in the Macrospore's left ear, was concerned, was that all of the commentators kept referring to the aforesaid process as the electoral process. It's electoral! Lomo Frenzy, now promoted to mushrap hat wearer, tried to explain to a group of reporters... They snickered and jeered, perhaps goaded by the high spirits their newly independent status had engendered. We have an election. Those who participate are electors. Why shouldn't the process thus described be the electoral one? Frenzy demanded. The reporters looked at one another. 
The people pronounce it as electoral, one of them pointed out. The people are wrong, Frenzy retorted. And not for the first time, muttered Manfred Dancer, watching this exchange at home. He and his dancer, he and his dancer development party had been the big losers in the recent election, gaining but one seat in the assembly, and that for a constituency far to the south, where no one was definite on, definite on whether the locals understood what was going on. Let it rest, Androgyna urged as she cro crocheted a warm coverlet for the TV. Well, I hate to say it, Dancer grumbled, but he's right. I mean, we have pastoral, not pastoral, and clitoral, not, not clitoral. Androgyna's crochet needles made a sound like the clash of swords between Errol Flynn and Basil Rathbone. Please, she cried, I'm trying to put all that past me. Dancer rolled his eyes to the other side of the room. In the macrospore's right ear, the massed agents of the Policy Enforcement Force met to discuss the situation. Before we continue, the lead agent, whose glasses were visible through his masked eye holes, addressed his colleagues. We need, to, we need to ascertain whether what the reporter said is true or not. Do the people really say electoral? I've got some data on that, Ron Camaro, another agent answered. He stood up and re read from a sheaf of papers in his hands. Our research and analysis division, analogous to the American CIA, has looked into the, this very matter. It seems that 78% of the populace, a clear majority, pronounce the word electoral. However, we feel that they only do so, do this because the media says it that way. And they in turn say it that way because say it that way because they feel it will go down well with the folks, the late agent, whose name was Bonco, theorized. Well, yes, Camaro agreed. Another agent, this one in a crude Elvis Costello, or was it Buddy Holly costume, asked a question. What about the other 22%? Camaro rummaged through his papers until he found what he was looking for. Um, it says here that they are, ev are split evenly between those who say the word properly and those who have never heard of it. Never heard of it, Camaro expostulated. Calm down, my friend, Bonko said soothingly. Those are just the ones who will be targeted come Poo Day. Poo Day? One of the junior agents whispered to a fellow. Purification Day, the latter explained. The macrospore itself longed to be... The, to end the bias against the use of the word was in a conditional sentence. It makes no sense, it complained to a contemporary. I was going to the store, he quoted. Why should was change to were just because one puts an if in front of that phrase? But the macrospore slowed down one thing at a time. First we'll deal with this pronunciation problem, then tackle usage. The other being a mountain of gray slime topped with a massive red ever-bobbing ear replied in its native tongue that it did not understand the microspore. Hablo sablum transcornablus. The microspore smiled and made a note in his agenda. Cloth macho. As James sniffed the fingers he had rubbed against the skin around his scrotum, enjoying what can only be described as a in, enjoying in what can only be described as a primal correlation, the cheese-like aroma thus transferred, he had no idea that he was being filmed, and not just filmed, added Mortoast, an expert in these matters, but mentally scanned, so that his emotions, his pleasure readings, were recorded. In this way, he could not later dissimulate or deny the truth of his reactions and motivations when confronted with the evidence. Mortos grinned with sadistic satisfaction and rubbed his thumb and, and, for, and rubbed his thumbs and fingertips together as if feeling the quality of a piece of silk. There were those in the room who found the whole thing distasteful, from James's actions to the authorities' plans to publicly hu humiliate him. Mortos, however, they seemed to incline they seemed inclined to like, as he was portrayed by the actor George Clooney. Although nominally a leading man, Clooney had agreed to play the repulsive character in exchange for the donation of a lot of surplus military playground equipment to the island of Haiti. The island of Haiti and its people I've always been close to my heart, the actor boasted, pulling his messianic beard through his tan athletic, fing athletic fingers. Look at those fingers, Grandma urged everyone. They are so like those of Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, but Jimmy Stewart could, could never handle a football the way George Clooney can, little Francesca pointed out. I wonder what his fingers smelled like. It was Grandpa who said this. Whose? Clooney's or Stewart's? Well, Stewart's, of course. Otherwise, I wouldn't have used the past tense. You've got to learn to think long term, Grandpa, Francesca lectured. By the time the report is published, George Clooney will be long dead. It's too late for me to think long term, little one, Grandpa retorted. By the time we get to the end of the page, I may be dead. And so he was, dead as a pope, laid out in virtuous ermine and tucked into a box. My consolation is in knowing that he doesn't know he's dead, Grandma sniffled as she, as she dried her tears. Who? Grandpa or Jimmy Stewart? Francesca wondered. Or George Clooney, Cousin Bradley added. Unc Bradley, 
Uncle Romeo, Uncle Romeo interjected. Exactly what is it you have against George Clooney? I don't have anything against Tim Bradley and Susan. He's a decent movie star whose looks are a throwback to the days of Clark Cary Grant, Cary Grant and Clark Gable. Whew. Uncle Romeo sounded relieved. But on the other hand, that's just it. Without his looks and that manly, take-charge voice of his, what is he? Just somebody who gets millions of dollars to pretend to be someone we're supposed to want to emulate. So, you're jealous. You're damn right I am. Bradley pounded on the, on the coffin. And then he throws his celebrity in our faces by espousing one cause after another, when, as Allen Ginsberg told us, the only way to improve the world is to improve oneself. As the supervisor of the death ritual entered the room, his, this lively family discussion ceased. Everyone took, took a seat and turned his eyes to the lectern, whereupon the ancient book was ready for consultation. It says here, the supervisor clad in ceremonial businessman's attire, that James Stewart bravely acknowledged his love of his own bodily stink, yea, even unto the black crud gathered under his fingernails after a good scratching probe. Of course, he chuckled, in Martin Luther's translation, that's a good probing scratch, but it is all the same in the eyes of the sky god. Jimmy Stewart portrayed Martin Luther in one of his early films, Grandma told everyone. I, be I believe he actually preferred to be called James, the supervisor replied. Ah, uh, but that was later, after he had become famous for reading his poetry on The Tonight Show. Imagine, what beco imagine becoming famous all over again for something besides acting. I wonder if that is what George Clooney is shooting for. Open lung. Bradley was paid $15 to come to Ms. Mr. Umpenslack's classroom and allow the students to study the interior of his chest cavity. The reason Mr. Antizest, Bradley's family name, is able to do this, explained Umpenslack Slack to his charges, is that he was wounded during the conflict in South Meridian. Isn't that right, Mr. Antizest? Yes, nodded Bradley slowly but emphatically. I was blown apart by what we call an improvised explosive device. In this case, it was a coffee can full of gasoline ignited by a sundial. The students crowded around as Bradley unbuttoned his. The students crowded around as Bradley unbuttoned his shirt. He sat on the overturned vending machine at the front of the room. The doctors put me back, me back together and installed this clever door in the front of my of my chest. I have another one around back for the elimination of waste. The hinges are made of cartilage covered with calluses. I have to buff them every day with a leather strap, or the calluses will get soft and the hinges will work themselves loose. Can you go swimming? One of the boys in the class asked. Laughter followed, but Bradley took the question seriously. Sure. But I have to coat the hinges with chicken grease first. He laid his neatly folded shirt beside him and opened the door to his chest with a little key. The class gasped as the assembly of vital organs was revealed. Now, class, what is this? Mr. Umpenslack asked, pointing to a throbbing purple mass at the bottom of the cavity. The heart? Someone guessed. No. Mr. Umpenslack shook his head. But it's beating, the student argued. True, but what else beats? The, the stomach? No, think. Beats like a, a drum? What kind of drum? Mr. Umpenslack insisted. An eardrum? Down in the abdomen? Come on, scholars, we've gone over this. Remember when we dissected the yak? Cattle drum, a voice called out. Mr. Umpenslack shook his head. He was about to tell, but another, another voice called out. Tom, Tom. And the answer was now obvious to all. Mr. Umpenslack, a girl spoke, pointing to a corrugated red organ higher up. What's that? Well, as Mr. Antizest has told you, a team of army doctors reassembled him, and in doing so, they were forced to take whatever measures they could to save his life. Now, ordinarily, the lungs would be two or three large, bean-shaped organs shot through with streaks of pastel blues and reds and lined with a fine coating of sand or soot. But in this case, Mr. Antizest is a modern pump lung made of enameled pig iron. And that's not all, Bradley announced. I reached into his open chest. There's a latch on one side that enables me to open up the lung itself. Careful now, Mr. Umpenslut cautioned. Don't worry, I can hold my breath for a good long while. Bradley, Bradley assured him. He flipped the latch on the side of the lung. The front swung away, reeling, revealing a small chamber in which a demonic creature, covered with blue-black fur, sat on a stool holding a plastic straw and a balloon. The class gasped in amazement. Your tax dollars at work, Mr. Umpenslut joked. It's no joke, the little creature yapped. He stood up from his seat and jumped down into Bradley's lap. I'm just another item on somebody's procurement manifest, but, he cried, clapping his hands together after first flinging away the straw and balloon, no more! I'm running away to Toronto! Stop him! Mr. Umpenslack ordered, but the, but the teacher was too late. The demon had already dashed out of the room. The students were in a panic, running about, overturning chairs and ripping inform informative posters from the walls. Bradley, meanwhile, calmly closed up his lung, then his chest, and waited to asphyxiate.